Well, first of all, thanks uh, for the invitation. It's really great to be here. Uh, I am definitely not a mathematician, but very data rich and blessed with data. I look forward to interactions with many of you and discussions. Uh, also, I feel a little bit like I'm on a university tour. I, I came from Michigan State yesterday where I gave a seminar and I can tell you it looked very different out the window <laughs> there than it does here. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I'll be talking about soil. Uh, a lot, of, as Jeff mentioned, a lot of our research is also in the human gut. Today, I'll be focusing our, on the soil microbiome. So uh, for those of you who aren't aren't uh, soil scientists, the, it's not just dirt. Soil is is really important for life on our planet. They carry out uh, key services that enable life on Earth. So th these are just a few of the things. They support growth of plants, cycle carbon, nitrogen, and so on. And so when you think about the health of soil, you know, this is from the USDA, you know, what defines a healthy soil? A lot of those things that are important for soil health are influenced and even controlled by the soil microbiome. So uh, that being said, we still have major knowledge gaps about uh, the soil microbiome. Uh, some of these are, uh, you know, we use soil to grow our crops. The, the world population is dependent on that. And the influence of cropping systems and amendments on soil properties, that's a huge knowledge gap. Also, how uh, interactions am among the soil ecosystems, nutrient availability and crop productivity, those interactions. And finally, the interactions between the soil ecosystems and climate, which is what my own research is, is focused on. So uh, when you think about the soil, the soil microbiome, we used to, so at Michigan State, that's where I got my PhD, and when I was there 35 years ago, we, we called soil a black box. You didn't know what was there. You knew that there were important things happening, but you didn't know which microorganisms were there, really. You could only cultivate a few of them. So the current state of the science, I'd say we're now more of a gray box-ish, <laughs> because you can sequence and you can find out which organisms are there. So this is the current status. And where we want to go, the desired outcome is to really understand what they're doing and to those metabolic um, pathways, you know, getting down into the fine grain levels of who's interacting with whom to carry out these fundamental biochemical processes. You know, even something as basic as cycling of CO2, release of CO2, and consumption of CO2. That is a very complicated process that is controlled by many different types of micro microorganisms that work in, in concert with each other. So, um, so where we, what we really need to do is move beyond the genotype, which is where if this is a community of, of soil organisms, you have bacteria, maybe a virus, and a, and a hyph hyph fung fungal hyphae, in green, and they're interacting. Uh, so if you look at a genome, this bacterium has a genome, and, <clears throat> and depending on the genes on the genome, it has different phenotypes, such as the ability to metabolize certain carbon compounds or be modal or quorum sensing. But not all of those genes are expressed under every condition. So we know that the genes are are uh, transcribed into RNA under certain conditions. You also have proteins that are produced under certain conditions. So this is regulated by the environment, and eventually you have metabolites. And so it's a lot more complex to understand the phenotype of an organism. And where we really want to go is beyond thinking of an individual organism's phenotype to the community phenotype. And that's this definition of metaphenome. And the metaphenome then would be the product of the total genes in the metagenome, so the sum of all the genomes, which is really a metagenome, times environmental factors that govern which genes are expressed. So here's a, my mathematical equation. <laughs> That's about as complex as I get. But, but, um, but this is really where we want to go. We have a collection of genomes times the environment and a community phenome or metaphenome. So this is what I'm talking about. When I'm, when I'm discussing that. And so, so, you know, the way that we're currently addressing and some examples that I'll show you trying to get to the metaphenome is using this multi-omics approach. And so where we go from the metagenome to the metatranscriptome to the metaproteome and finally the metabolome 
And this data, you know, our hope <coughs> is that by integrating this data, we can start to derive the metaphenome of the system, of the community. So um, um, I knew the theme of, the t of this uh, workshop. You know, microbial ecology is a quantitative science. Uh, it, it is, it, it requires applied mathematics. Um, so, so some examples are quantification of microbial numbers, both absolute and relative abundances. Uh, comparisons, of course, comparisons between treatments as in any science. Um, estimates of temporal dynamics and reaction rates. Uh, data analytics and omics integration. So I kind of alluded to this in the previous uh, slide and predictions using models. So there's a lot of modeling using this data to make better predictions of potential impacts of climate change, for example. And then you ha have, every have everything from individual-based models, <coughs> metabolic models. There's, um, we have some projects that are incorporating machine learning uh, to, to take advantage of patterns to, and machine learning algorithms as well. <coughs> So um, I'll be talking about uh, a couple of examples. First, um, permafrost thaw and, and the so climate change impacts on the soil microbiome. So first of all, permafrost soil currently sequesters a large amount of terrestrial carbon. So there's as much carbon in Arctic permafrost as there's currently in the atmosphere and vegetation combined. And so you can consider it like a giant freezer of carbon. And as the permafrost starts to melt, the microbes in the soil start to become active in metabolizing it and releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So it's a huge concern. Uh, the second example are grassland soils, which are also um, a deposit, a re repository of terrestrial carbon, a huge amount of carbon is in these grassland soils. And the models predict changes in precipitation patterns with climate change, and how will that impact carbon cycling? So um, starting in the Arctic, so this is just um, an example of, this is a very, the Arctic is very vulnerable to climate change. I'm sure most of you have heard about that. So we're already seeing signs of these very dramatic perturbations in the Arctic. So everything from coastal erosion, the sinking of the landscape as the permafrost thaws into these thermocarst bogs, these, these lake type things, shrinking lakes. Uh, these are kind of interesting features here. We have ice wedges that form into the permafrost and you get something called a polygon. If you look at it from the air, it looks like a puzzle almost. You get these little polygon features. Um, and then you have the microbial um, activity that's enhanced as the permafrost starts to thaw. So if, it, if we take a cross section through permafrost, so permafrost by definition has, is, has to have been frozen for at least two consecutive years to be called permafrost. But most of it has been frozen for thousands, if not longer, of years. So here you have the permafrost. On top of the permafrost, you have the active layer. And the active layer is the soil that is seasonally thawed and frozen. So, um, and here's an example of an ice wedge and a thermokarst. So as the permafrost thaws, this active layer gets deeper. So you have a deepening of the active layer. And that makes the carbon more accessible to the microorganisms that then, because it's thawed, it's easier for them to metabolize the carbon. And if it's uh, anaerobic, release methane, aerobic, release CO2. So these are examples of areas where, where our group has been focusing. So most of our research has been in, in Alaska. Uh, we also have some in Svalbard off the coast of Norway, and this is this is actually me off the off the coast of Greenland. Uh, we we have some quite a few collaborations with Greenland as well. <coughs> so the first study that we did, and this was a few years ago now, and and, and published was to look if you, at a very simple example. If you take frozen permafrost and active layer samples into the laboratory and you thaw it at five degrees, what happens? and we used a metagenome approach. And so here you can see the frozen permafrost and the active layer, so the permafrost is in blue, and um, they're different. You know, if you just look at their metagenome, the genes, they're different. And if you map those onto biochemical reaction maps, in blue you see, see genes that are enriched in permafrost, in red genes that are enriched in the active layer. 
uh, wh what we th thought was really interesting is that if you take these two frozen cores, they're, they're like three meters apart from each other, and they've been frozen. These have been, were frozen for thousands of years. And then you take them into the lab after two days. So if you, they're in the frozen state, they're pretty different from each other. But as they start to thaw, they start to converge. And by day seven, they're much more similar to each other. And then we, this was a short incubation, but we predict that they would be approaching, these are the active layer samples, that they would approach the active layer community given enough time. So rapid shift in metagenomes upon thaw is the message from that paper. So then we went, uh, we wondered what happens in, um, with a natural thaw. So that was the laboratory thaw. And so in this study, oh, by the way, I have a lot of pictures of people, and I'm going to forget to acknowledge them. So please notice their photographs and their names. These are the people who did the work. So, um, so here in this study, um, so we had permafrost active layer from the field, and then one of these collapsed thermokarst fogs. So it's a transition gradient, a fog gradient. Uh, so now we're using a multi-omics approach. This, this study was a little later. So we had the metagenomes, we had metatranscriptomes, and we had metaproteomes. And that allowed us to get more information about what was happening. So for example, just simply mapping the metatranscriptome reads to the metagenome reads, read abundances, we could look at which members of the community were more active in the permafrost active layer or bog. The colors are corresponding there. Um, so, for example, Yuri Archaeota, which include methanogens, were higher in the bog, which is where the methane is produced, so that was a nice validation of this method. Uh, when we looked at the proteomes, uh, this is one of the first metaproteome studies in soil. Um, it was really interesting to us because these, this is the permafrost metaproteome mapped to the metagenome from permafrost and to some reference organisms. Here's the active layer and here's the bog. Um, so when we looked at the permafrost, the current dogma was that there would not be much going on there. You know, it's frozen. But we saw a lot of proteins for iron reduction, including a lot that corresponded to an, a, a very well-known iron-reducing organism, Rotoferrox peroxidans. And so we didn't, we didn't expect that. And so we went back to the site and found that indeed there was iron reduction happening in the frozen permafrost. And so I think that's a nice example of how you can use this information to make new hypotheses and then go back and test. OK, so for, for the rest of this talk, I'll be talking about a different system. I'll be talking about grassland soils. This is more of our, our current work. Uh, for, and grassland soils, as I mentioned earlier, if you just look at the color um, the darker brown is where the carbon is concentrated, and these are the great prairies, the great plains, where we have the, the grasslands. And also in Washington, we have a lot of grasslands. That's where the carbon is concentrated. And climate models are predicting that there will be increasing drought in most of these areas uh, with time. So the question is really, what's gonna, what will happen to that carbon in those grasslands um, soils? So we're taking a cross-scale approach uh, to look at this. So everything from the landscape scale, we have a field trial set up with an irrigation field trial. So we can look at, you know, manipulate the moisture. Uh, at the core level, these are our laboratory incubations. Uh, at the microscopic level, we're looking at like soil chips, microscopic chips, and also reduced complexity communities and then using all our genomics and omics approaches. And each of these scales has a different kind of, of information that lend themselves to different kinds of models. So at the landscape scale, these are landscape models. Soil carbon models at the, at the core scale, agent-based models when you're looking at these reduced complexity systems, but still at the microbes. And finally, um, at the omics level, the models are more the metabolic models, pathway models. So uh, if at the field scale, uh, we've been really focusing on um, metagenomics to start with. So we're comparing, so this is Washington where, where I work now. It's a very dry land system. You have to irrigate, really, to get crops to grow. 
Um, Kansas is irrigated but also gets rain, and then Iowa is rain fed and tile drained. So these are different types of grasslands based on their, on their management strategies. So we um, obtained huge metagenomes <laughs> from each of these. We call them the monster metagenomes, and they truly are monsters. Uh, it, they, they required special collaborations with uh, folks at NERSC to be able to assemble them and they're beta testing their new assembly uh, algorithms using our interesting data. So these are the three uh, metagenomes. They're all over a tera, tera base in length. Um, and, and then what you do is then you can do gene prediction, mapping. This is the number of reads. So the redder colors are more reads that are mapped, and blue are, are, are reads, and then clear you don't have as many reads. So huge numbers of reads, and you can start to get an image of the biochemical potential of the, of the metagenomes. And what we've been looking, uh, this is just a little side vignette, is uh, for example, you can mine these for viruses. And so vi the soil virome has just recently been studied, and it's basically mainly relying on the metagenome data. So you can mine metagenomes for viruses. And so what, what we've been doing is um, developing a new pipeline for, for confident assignment of viral sequences from metagenomes, because there are a lot of tools out there. But by combining those tools, we're able to get more, more highly confident assignments of viral contigs. <clears throat> and using this approach, then we've been able to, across these three different soils, soil metagenomes, Washington, Iowa, and Kansas, start to get viral clusters. And these, um, when we look at these clusters, so this is a blow up of this region here, we can, st we can start to find some interesting patterns. So for example, this cluster is specific to Kansas. So we just see it in that, in that soil. We see some other viral clusters that are more common across the different soils. So we find them in all different soils. And, s and sometimes we're blessed <laughs> with something that is similar to something that's already been described. And these, these we call the, the well-studied clusters. Those are very rare. The majority have, have no similarity to anything that's ever been described. But we're happy when we get a match. Uh, then you can take those viral clusters and map them to potential hosts. And that's what we see here. Uh, we're finding hosts across different kingdoms, animal kingdoms, archaea, bacteria, and fungi. I don't know if you can see these colors. Uh, for example, the archaea are here. The majority are um, bacterial hosts. And what, are, what are the two phyla that are particularly, where the funnel ends up in? <coughs> these two? Yeah. Uh, we get a lot of, I think it's um, proteobacteria and actinobacteria. Okay. And so, so the common. So the, the soil, the common soil. Yeah, the most dominant soil microbes. Okay. So kind of nice, nicely makes sense. <laughs> Um, and another thing that, this is something, I get excited about a lot of things, <laughs> but this is something that I'm very excited about, is finding these novel auxiliary metabolic genes, AMGs, that have never been seen before in viruses. And we have hundreds of those. So we have a collaboration with the Joint Genome Institute to, ex to express them and validate their functions. These are just a few of the viruses that are carrying things AMGs for aromatic compound degradation and carbohydrate, complex carbohydrate degradation. We have many other ones that are super novel, have never been described before, so novel that I'm not even going to mention them today. But we're looking forward to seeing if it's real or not. Yeah? Can you give us some of the mapping of like, the percentage of metabolic processes that have been explained by genes and like the percentage that are missing? Because it seems like you're kind of uncovering some percentage of the missing stuff. Yeah, you mean like gap filling yeah. and things like that. Uh, we, we're, we are going to do that. We haven't done it yet. Yeah, but you can, you can see when you look at these, at these um, the viral scaffolds, that there are a lot of genes that are unknown. And you, would, you can predict if you map them onto the pathway what they might be. And viruses are kind of funky too because they have a lot of these teeny little, these teeny little uh, ORFs, which is, I don't know why. That's very strange. But we're not the only ones that have found that. I'm sorry, how big are these genomes uh, for the viruses? Are they longer than what you see before you got, for example? 
these are completely novel. Yeah. So yeah. The only ones that were sim I mean, we found some, you know, that's what I was trying to say. Here, there's some that are similar to other described viruses that are in viral databases. Um, I think these were from mycobacterium, uh, have been described before. And so then you have reference viruses. But the vast, vast majority, no, they're, they're not similar to anything that's been described. So, um, oop, going the wrong way. Uh, so that was my little virus vignette. Um, so getting back to the metagenomes, I mean, it, it's wonderful to get all of this data. It's just incredibly complex. And so one thing that we've been doing is trying to break, dissect that huge complexity into what we call functional modules. And we do this using an enrichment approach. We enrich on different substrates. And you can see by looking at what is enriched in these different substrates, you start to get some differences in patterns, just at a pattern level, in, the, in what is expressed. These are transcripts, I should say. Uh, what is expressed under these different conditions. So to give a little bit more detail, these are the enrichments that we used. We used two simple carbon substrates. One is N-acetylglucosamine, which is the uh, monomer for chitin, and it has both nitrogen and carbon. Uh, xylose is another simple substrate. We added an antibiotic with glucose to inhibit the gram negatives. And then we have a couple of complex um, substrates, cyanine, pectin, pectin. And so when we look at the metatranscriptomes, you can see, you can start to see differences. And fortunately, I mean, you would expect that. Uh, primarily when you add an antibiotic, uh, as, as we hoped, you're knocking out a lot of the gram negatives. And that allows some more um, expression from the gram positives. Uh, the two, these are the two more simple substrates. Their expression patterns are more similar to each other. And then for the two more complex substrates here, they also have more similar similarities, but differences as well. And you can see that they nicely cluster on these PicoA plots according to their enrichment. Pectin was a little outlier, uh, this one here. And then we also see that on the 16S level. And so looking at what those functions are, you know, starting to dig down a little bit into that, we can see, uh, for example, um, more amino acid metabolism when we add this um, antibiotic here. So some interesting things there. This is new data. We're still exploring it. And then we get some other differences as well. So, so we can start to understand m by parsing out this complexity, we get more, hopefully, more information about the details of the, of the metabolism. Uh, then we did additional perturbations on these incubations to kind of tease, make it further separated. So we added different kinds of stress using these three substrates. Uh, we added our herbicide. We did longer incubations. Added PEG to, as a drought uh, treatment that lowers the water, available water. Higher pH, light, lower temperature, heat, and salt. And you can see by looking at the colors, for example, with salt, that is a big driver away from the rest of the community. This is all 16S data, so we're looking at community responses. Um, we see all the peg is, is like at the other end of the, of, the, of the chart, and a lot of very interesting differences. Again, brand new data, but now we can start to tease even deeper into these pathways. Uh, and one thing that we found that we didn't anticipate, yes, was that if we look at the core OTUs in the source soil, so this, these would be the core OTUs that we find, and then if we add, if we did different kinds of incubations, added antibiotics, and so on, and then you, this is cumulative core OTUs. So when you, you add a simple substrate, you get some core OTUs that you find in the source soil, when you add then treatments with antibiotics, you get more, uh, and so on and so on and so on. So you add more of the core OTUs. Mm -hmm. However, the thing we didn't anticipate was that we get a lot, these should be filled in, it's not just blank, we get a lot more OTUs that we didn't have as core OTUs in the source soil. So we're extending, we're getting the rare biosphere that are enriched under those different conditions. So we're getting a lot more information about the biochemical potential.
of that soil and using this kind of approach. So um, I told you we're interested in understanding how they respond to soil moisture. And um, so if you think about a field and you're measuring something like CO2, you can see how the moisture is going to influence the ability of microorganisms to interact with each other. So if you have more water, you would hypothesize you get more interactions between discrete consortia with less water, less interactions. So we, we wanted to test this. So this was done using a, a multi-omics approach. This was Kansas. So from three different locations in Kansas, and then this, it was a simple experiment, either wetting to saturation or drying, completely drying, and then running our multi-omics on that to see what we would find as a response to soil moisture. <coughs> so um, to make a long story short, <laughs> what we found, if you, we compare the controls and the wet treatments uh, for the community and the metabolites, they didn't vary that much. These soils are naturally kind of on the wet side, so by wetting it, you know, they didn't really shift very much. But when we dried the soils, we had a shift across all of these omics levels. So the community shifted, the express genes shifted, and the metabolites also shifted. So drying initiated a metaphenomic response in, that, in the microbiome. And so what, ex you know, that, that is interesting, but not really super satisfying because you don't really know what happened. And so when we look at the metabolic signatures, we're starting to get into what, what is a little bit more satisfying to me anyhow, uh, trying to see what specifically, so these are the three sites in all of these little graphs, and red is the dry, blue, wet, and the, the clear is the control. So we can see what is significantly higher upon drying or, or wetting. And as an example, so if I just blow that up a little, because I know it's a lot of data, uh, sucrose was significantly higher across all three of those locations. Uh, the field locations were pretty disparate from each other, but this is a significantly consistent response, increasing sugar. And that makes sense because when cells are stressed, they do that, they're known to do that, to accumulate sugars and osmolites to protect themselves against, you know, in that osmotic, uh, osmotically sensitive environment so that they don't burst. So they accumulate sugars, and so we're seeing that here. <coughs> so then when you map those, so this is a network that includes both the metabolite and transcriptome <coughs> data, we can then start to see what are the key features of a dry state or a, a wet state. And the dry is in red and the wet is in blue, so we mainly see signatures of dryness. So starch and sucrose metabolism is an example there. And then if you go down into the pathway level detail, we can see what specifically, uh, this is metabolite and transcriptome data, so it kind of leads into this gap filling approach, but at a community level, we can see that tree halos, which is a, a very well known osmolite, is the pathways for production are increased upon drying, and the pathways for degradation are increased up upon wetting. So it makes a, it's, it's nice to see you can do that at a community bulk level and get something that makes sense. So, um, so the, the next part I'll be talking about is looking at, again at something a little bit more specific. So we, we, have, we needed to focus our experiments on a specific carbon substrate. We chose chitin, and chitin is um, the second most abundant carbon polymer on the planet, and you can see the repeating units of NAG. Um, and it's found in shellfish, insects, and fungi. In soil, you know, fungi are abundant, and they could be a source of food, you know, for the other members of the community. And this is the chitin degradation pathway. Uh, chitin's interesting because it should require different organisms to break it down. It, it's not very often that one organism can do the whole job. So uh, again, focusing on reduction of complexity, so we, we developed a model chitin degrading soil consortium, and um, we used a couple of different approaches, incubations in sterile soil, uh, plus um, NAG, or uh, growth on plates with chitin. Uh, so here we were able to, um, during very long-term enrichments over weeks, several weeks, 15 weeks, 
we're able to um, reduce the complexity of the source soil, but still retain the key <coughs> members that you have in the original soil. That was really important to us. We didn't want to get something that's completely unusual. And uh, if you look at the stability over time, these are different dilutions. We can see that you, this is the, the source soil here. I think this is richness. So um, over time, you start to, you have an initial decline in <coughs> richness, and then it kind of stabilizes around 200 or so OTUs, but it's still an order of magnitude less than you have in the store source soil, and it's very stable. So we were able to um, isolate some, some members of that community. This is one of the consortia that we're focusing on now. And uh, it, because we want to use it as a model, a uh, micro soil microbial community, it's important we can store it and reconstitute it. And it's just showing that it, they can be restored and reconstituted on glycerol or on, by lyophilization. And then we have several isolates. There are about 20 members of this community. And uh, looking at the isolates, so now I'm finally getting back to isolation, which microbial ecologists <laughs> haven't been, you know, that used to be the only thing you could do. Then with all the sequencing, nobody was isolating, hardly. And now you really want to get back to isolating. So it's kind of interesting through my career to see how, how the community has come back to appreciate the need for isolates. And so these are, these are some of the isolates that we have. And that now that we have the isolates, we can combine them in different com combinations and, and get better models of how they interact either uh, cooperatively <coughs> or competitively. And this is some early data on different substrates, but showing we either have negative interactions with some species, or positive interactions, or, or neutral interactions. I can't read the, that, but some of them are, are, are more neutral here. So, um, so that then we can use for these agent-based models and start to predict what's happening. And this is what we're doing right now. Uh, we can also um, put these consortia back into sterile soil under different incubation conditions and then do network analysis to try to understand who's interacting with whom just by doing network analysis. And that's also really, really exciting. So here, here we see a network, a Pearson correlation coefficient network using abundance data. Um, these are all labeled phylum order genus and we can start to get some, <coughs> some ideas of who might be interacting with whom. And if we color these by the nature, the weight and the nature of the associations. So in green is positive interactions. In red, you have negative interactions. Here we have um, more positive interactions. They're much stronger. You can tell by the weighting here. These two guys apparently like each other and they're nobody else. They're just off by themselves. But um, we start to get more information. Then you can uh, make a network using the nodes colored by order and start to see again, so these are all in the same order, uh, and as are these, but we're getting some cross-order interactions. And finally, you can, um, you can use centrality, so you can <coughs> cluster them by centrality and look at which of these OTUs are more central in the network. And what, <laughs> what we're finding there is this rhodococcus is the most, is um, really being highlighted as the most important based on centrality. And rhodococcus is, is one of the ones we have isolated. And so we're thinking, you know, now we can make some very detailed hypotheses and go back and see how rhodococcus is interacting positively or negatively with these other organisms in isolation and pairwise. So um, I'm just going to conclude uh, with a couple of slides saying that now that we have these model consortia, there are other programs that are interested in them. Uh, they're very unique and valuable. So we have a, a DARPA uh, project that is using these consortia as a model to distinguish friends and foes. So who the good guys versus the bad guys. And so these are, the, these are our good soil microbes. And then you can use that as a background for a pathogen. Uh, we also have a NASA project that is interested. Um, the, the thing about that project is what happens, we know or we can predict what happens on Earth, what happens in space. When you, when you have microgravity conditions and you have a soil community in space. So we'll be doing experiments on, on ground control compared to 
experiments on the International Space Station and see how these consortia interactions are varied, if at all, during incubation in space. So uh, in summary, we live on a microbial planet. We may send some stuff to the space station, but, <laughs> but pretty much it's here on Earth. Our planet is undergoing change with unknown consequences, really unknown consequences on these key functions that are essential for life. And although we have this high throughput sequencing capability, I'm very thankful for that. We're getting a lot of information about composition. The next frontier is really understanding function and how those are impacted by change. So I'd like to acknowledge we have a big group working on the soil microbiome. This is a, a project funded by the Department of Energy. Uh, Kirsten Hoffmuckel, some of you may know her, is my co-PI on that project, and we have about 20, 20 to 30 folks that are working on that. And um, thank you for your attention. <laughs>